all of the speakers have been warned, five minutes, and then we yank them off. They will hear a timer. Okay. When the bomb explodes, they're out of there. Five minutes. We have a five minute timer here. If you could load the slides, please. Or do I do that here? Yeah, sorry, I'm Matt, Matt Bennett, I'm from Vancouver. <laughs> Radica Park Cash. I'm so, ti the timing is so specific. Um, okay. There's no time to tell you, uh, tell Ex you who you exactly. are. Um, we'll get our first uh, speaker to come up, please. Um, and there are certain, so thanks to the planning committee, you can read that there. Uh, each person has five minutes to talk. Then we'll talk about, we can answer questions, we can talk about what people actually do. Um, there are section three credits, um, so and these are pre-test questions. So how does the ejection fraction affect the benefit derived from an ICD? Um, and those are within the Q&A. You can get them on the poll, the answer, what I expect the answer to be, or what we expect the answer to be. And how does uh, AFib affect CRT pacing? This is the first poll. How many push-ups should speakers have to do if they go overtime? None, the wrong answer. Uh, five, 10, 15, and 20. You can vote now. I don't want to take too much time. Uh, 20, 20, we got. Not none, come on. Three. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, so first Steve will come up. Um, and then we'll start the, uh, the clock. Thanks, Steve. I'll let you introduce yourself. Hello, I'm uh, Steve Wilton from Calgary, and I have the pleasure of leading off this session. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be invited here, and it's actually quite a challenge to go over this topic. So I'll, I'll just read the, the title. A single chamber ICD should be used for all patients with AF, left bundle branch block, and a low EF. So, Doing it in five minutes is kind of like debating somebody on Twitter. You lose a lot of the nuance, but I'll, I'll do my best. So, short amount of time, I'm going to make just a few points for you. So first, atrial fibrillation is different, not just for CRT, for other things as well, and it's not good. Second, atrial fibrillation messes with what we're trying to do in CRT, and so that's why it's not a surprise that it actually doesn't work very well in patients with persistent atrial fibrillation. Next. CRT is not a fun procedure to do, so why do it unless there's a really good reason to do it? And finally, just a plug for our ongoing trial. So, what do we know about heart failure and atrial fibrillation outside of CRT? So this is data from a pooled, meta, pooled individual patient meta-analysis of the pivotal beta blocker trials that, that established the benefit of those drugs in patients with systolic heart failure. It's brain dead. Everyone who has heart failure should be on a beta blocker. But wait a second, what about the 20% of patients in these trials who had atrial fibrillation? Not even a hint of a benefit. So it gives us a clue that atrial fibrillation is different and it can impact the benefit of our therapies. So let's think about CRT. How does CRT even work? At a very simplistic level, which is how I operate, um, CRT works by first optimizing atrioventricular timing, as you know, and second by pacing the ventricles synchronously to restore ventricular contraction that's synchronous. So does that work in, in patients in persistent atrial fibrillation? Of course not. So patients who are in atrial fibrillation obviously don't get the benefit of atrioventricular timing, and there's great evidence that CRT, unless the patient is very well recontrolled or has a complete AV junction ablation, fails to deliver therapy in many of the beats. So this is a nice example from an older paper from the same paper where they did 12 lead ECG analysis for 24 hours on patients who are undergoing CRT with persistent atrial fibrillation, they found that 20 to 30% of the beats were not effectively paced. And also that the device counters dramatically overestimate the pacing percentage. So what do we know from clinical trials about AFib and CRT? So you can see there that the most of the pivotal trial investigators were well aware of the problems, and so they excluded patients with, with atrial fibrillation from their trials. In the RAF study, the Canadian study, we wanted to test the hypothesis in this important subgroup, and so a, a proportion of patients with atrial fibrillation were enrolled, and in fact, randomization was stratified. 
we published on this, or Dr. Healy published on this, and found that in fact there was no benefit in that subgroup, whereas overall the therapy was extremely beneficial. But when you look at what's going on in the real world, about a quarter of the patients have atrial fibrillation. So there's a disconnect between what the trials tell us and what we're actually doing in real life. And, and, and we see that in, in our own hospitals today. So let's not forget that CRT is different than putting in a, a VVI ICD. So there are increased risk of complications. On the left panel, you'll see data from the RAF trial and uh, that most of the complications are numerically higher. If you put them all together, pooling the data uh, with the made at CRT trial, both contemporary trials of CRT, there's more than a doubling of overall complications at 30 days. And this is all the patients, not just the AF patients. So it's worth thinking about that when you're doing a more complex procedure, of course there's going to be more complications. So, and we all know this, those of us who do these procedures know that it is hard. So compared with a VVI ICD, it takes longer, you're exposed to more x-rays, there's a chance that the procedure won't work at all, and there's a higher, much higher chance you'll have to come back and do it again. So when we're talking to patients, we show them pictures like the one on the right. This is how we do CRT. There's a nice little vein around the back. We slide it in there. Everything's good. What we see in real life is there's a mess a lot of the time, and it's very, very hard to find the right place, and that's why it's frustrating. So if you don't believe me, just ask my debate opponent. So Dr. Kriachen, for those of you who don't know him, is an exceptional clinician. He's brilliant, and he's very gifted with his hands. He's literally the person that I would want to operate on my relative if they came to our hospital. And you can see all the procedures that he performs at our hospital, a very long list of highly technical, difficult procedures. And what's missing is that he's smart enough to not want to do CRT. So um, just to summarize, this is a, a nice quote from a recent uh, perspective article about how to think about these questions when we don't know the answer. And thinking about it from the patient perspective, what would you do? Read the quote. There's my summary. Thank you. <laughs> Good. So. Thanks, Steve. Um, perfect timing. Uh, Vikas, you've got your work uh, cut out for you. Vikas Kariachin from Calgary. Hi. Um, so I, unlike my colleague, I do think that CRT uh, should be used in all patients with atrial fibrillation, left bundle, and a low EF. I'm Vikas Kriyashan, one of the EPs from Calgary. Uh, no real disclosures, except that when you Google Wilton, you get all sorts of pictures on the internet. So I tried to use ones that were a little bit professional. Uh, also didn't want to upset him, because he's not that nice a guy if you uh, make him angry. So uh, just for anybody just to do a little thought experiment, do you have any patients with AFib that end up getting a CRT? And have you had patients with CRT who developed AFib and you continue to buy VPACE anyway at that point? I think the answer is going to be yes for everybody because this is actually a pretty significant number of patients. About 20 to 40 per percent of patients with CRT will meet that criteria. Uh, as Dr. Wilton already pointed out, CRT helps improve LV function by helping with minimizing dyssynchrony between all the cardiac chambers. This translates to uh, symptom relief from heart failure symptoms as well as maybe survival benefits in some and improvement in ejection fraction. When you have atrial fibrillation, because of the irregularity, because of sometimes the rates are not as well controlled even with minimal exertion, you may not be able to get good uh, bi-V pacing. And when it comes to CRT, bi-V pacing is super important. Uh, there's a few studies on this. This is one of the ones that I like where they showed that the ones who are paced the highest, over 99.6%, there's a 24% relative risk reduction in mortality. So our, they, the author said our goal should always be to try and aim for over 98% by V-pacing in patients. What do the CCS guidelines say about CRT? The ideal patient is somebody with heart failure symptoms, EF less than 35%, QRS greater than 130 with a left bundle, um, and renal function that's uh, over 30, and sinus rhythm. But they don't say that you cannot put something in somebody with atrial fibrillation. You can still consider it. And that's consistent with some of the other major society guidelines as well, where it's a class 2A, level of evidence B, and uh, for permanent atrial fibrillation patients. If you look at actually all the studies, there's a few of them that are there, and you can't actually read them, but I can. Um, they basically are looking at patients that had CRT and ICD devices placed, and then obviously some of them had AFib, and they're looking at was there a benefit or not. And when you look at those studies, it looks like putting an ICD or a CRTD doesn't really make a difference. This includes a RAF study that Dr. Wilton pointed out. And this is sort of one of the, the basis of the debate saying, you know, why should we consider anything more in these patients? 
But what's interesting, when you actually look at studies that do AV junction ablation in patients with permanent AF uh, and they had CRT, they actually did have some improvements, including in hard endpoints such as mortality. And in fact, that similar results to patients in sinus rhythm. So what we probably really need to have very good control of atrial fibrillation, which might mean AV junction ablation. Uh, and interestingly, up to 10% of patients with permanent AF with CRT, because of the positive effects of remodeling, can actually revert back to sinus rhythm, which is actually very interesting and probably a benefit for the patients. Then some people say, well, what about the cost? And in Canada these days, because we have pretty good provincial contracts, the device between a CRTD and an ICD is really not that much different. It's maybe an ICD plus a few iPhones. If you look at ongoing studies on atrial fibrillation and CRT, there are quite a few. There are some Canadian studies as well as studies around the world. Uh, what this means is we still need to know more information on this, but it also shows that we don't have enough evidence to deny CRT in patients with atrial fibrillation, especially since currently they account for maybe up to 40% of all CRT patients. And as one of my last slides, Dr. Wilton did actually a review a few years ago and he concluded that performing an AV node ablation may improve CRT outcomes in patients with AFib. So I, I think CRT can be used in patients with atrial fibrillation who meet other criteria for a CRT, but our goal should be to try and get over 98% by V pacing. And that might require looking at AV node junction ablation in many patients. For non-permanent forms of AF, it's not really clear what the best treatment is, but I think the idea should be that you should be getting over 98%, so that might need ablation, antiarrhythmics, and maybe even AV junction ablation in some. So although Dr. Wilton may believe in his uh, unique system of belief, I think we all should go with uh, what we've seen so far, and he'll be alone. <laughs> Thank you. So now we've got some time for questions. Um, bit of discussion. Uh, I want to hear from, you know, the, the debates are always one of those things where you hear very slanted views. People might not actually believe what they're saying, but this is where I want people to discuss. You know, you guys tell me, what, what do you actually do? You know, do you offer people CRT um, if they've got AFib, low ejection fraction, left bundle? In whom would you not? In whom would you? Uh, what's your Gestalt, and, and you know, we've got a lot of uh, experts in the field, so I'd like to hear from you as well, please. Yeah, so the neat part about this debate is neither of us actually implant CRT, so you don't have to listen to anything that we say. Um, however, um, we see these patients, and I think it's important to, to recognize we've made it black and white. I think there's a big difference between persistent AFib and, and paroxysmal AFib, so if you can control the AFib, and, and it's much easier when it's paroxysmal, it, it, it still might be very useful to use CRT. Um, we published a paper about the patients who developed AFib uh, after CRT in the RAF study, and in fact, the burden remained relatively low in those patients, and it did not impact outcomes. So it's really the persistent AFib patients that I was talking about in my portion of the debate. But would you not, would you never implant a persistent AFib person? I would try to put them in the RAFT permanent AF trial, yeah. if at all possible. So maybe describe that, just as a plug to the, the people who aren't uh, Yeah, so the, the RAFT permanent AF trial arose out of that analysis that Dr. Healy did, showing uh, in a small number of patients no obvious benefit of CRT in these folks, and so uh, designed a proper, uh, properly powered study to address that question. It's been a tough study to enroll in, but uh, it's still ongoing, and... Uh, it's, it still remains an important question because, as Vikas said, it's about, you know, a quarter to 40 percent of the patients who might be eligible who are affected. But until we have randomized data, and even though my review came out eight years ago, there's still no published randomized data uh, showing that it's helpful. And maybe, yeah, either Radhika or um, Bernard, Derek, yeah, so, Francois, David? Uh, yeah, feel free to, to come up. Uh guys, but um, I agree with Steve. I put them into the RAF perm AF study if at all possible. Uh, I think the, one of the important things to uh, achieve if you are going to try and uh, put CRT in patients with atrial fibrillation is to achieve that 98% pacing. And uh, in, in the RAF perm AF trial, now I have not been doing uh, AV node ablation uh, because, you, you know, the risks uh, associated with that, but uh, certainly have been trying to achieve uh, the percent pacing, and, and that could have been part of the reason 
uh, in raft that we may not have achieved uh, our desired outcome with CRT and AF. I mean, it could also be, of course, the, the, the lack of asynchrony in the AF itself um, that they don't respond. But I think that's the, the most important thing that, that we try to, uh, to do it properly uh, when we, we put it into those patients, even in the context of the, the clinical trial. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't go into too much details because of time, but um, I think when you have CRT in patients with AFib, it's, sometimes it is hard to know how much IV pacing there, you know, unless you go through the counters in detail. Sometimes the fusion stuff gets counted as actual pacing. The other thing is a lot of patients maybe at baseline, their AFib is well controlled, but as soon as they're walking around, their rate starts going up. So I think, it, you know, as these guys are saying, enrolling them in a study is probably the best option, but I wouldn't deny somebody CRT based on AFib. But it might be a criteria that if they've got other reasons why you think they wouldn't be a good candidate, I would certainly think of AFib as another reason maybe why you shouldn't, but I wouldn't use that as a sole reason. Yeah, I, I, these are some of my thoughts that, you know, people without lateral scar, um, more symptomatic patients, the wider the left bundle. Um, if you think they're going to need a lot of pacing, there's a sort of pacing indication for it. Um, I really have a lot of trouble in that, you know, it, it, as well if you think they, they need an AV ablation and they might have an element of tachycardia-mediated cardiomyopathy, their EF should uh, improve with better rates. But I really have trouble with that group where the, the heart rate's 70 to 90 on average, and they've got left bundle, and they're NYT 2.2, uh, you know. Um, so, yeah, it, I don't think it's totally clear, but, I, you know, it, we've tried to enroll a lot in RAF per MAF, but we always get the patients who are NYT 3 plus, and Somebody says, well, you're going to deny them CRT. Don't you think they'll improve? Um, so we've, we've had a lot of trouble enrolling. Okay, any other questions or comments um, while we have the other speakers start to come up? Yeah, so, so the question is about the counters. Usually just Holter monitoring uh, would be, the, you know, no. Yeah, so obviously. some of the counters, depending on the device, you can it separates the fusion and actual pacing. Good. So, how to get you off? Sure. So I'm going to introduce um, <clears throat> the next debate. Uh, so this one is uh, Dr. Blondine Mondesert from. Uh, Montreal and Pablo Neri from Ottawa will be debating the SICD versus the transvenous ICD, uh, whether the SICD should be first line for all patients that are young, prior infection, etc., when an ICD is indicated. So, Blondine. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. So I have five minutes to convince you that the SICD is the better option for uh, young people and uh, patients with prior infection. Um, so why we try to do something else than the transgenic ICD? Actually, in this um, review, we saw that the, uh, SI, the transgenic ICD has a lot of long-term uh, complication. It was done in the young population, and we can see that there is 4.5% per year of complication uh, in the young patients, especially some infection, and most of them actually are more on device uh, malfunction and lead malfunction. So I can show you some example of uh, lead uh, complication. Here it's when a patient with a VVI uh, ICD implanted in primary prevention, and it just came up at the uh, emergency room with uh, some multiple shocks. And uh, with the uh, interrogation of the ICD, you can see that there is a lot of noise on the ventricular lead, and uh, actually it was a lead fracture. I show you like um, a zoom on the X-ray, uh, and you can very clearly see the lead fracture. He came back two years after that with uh, multiple PVCs, and you can see that the lead is going back in the uh, ventricle, actually in the atrium, in the right atrium, and it, it was responsible of the PVCs. So at the end of the day, I have to extract everything in that patient and to put a SICD to avoid any more complication. Another example, a patient on the left side with the subclavian thrombosis due to uh, ICD again, and uh, you can see that the left arm is uh, swelling and there's a lot of, uh, the size is very bigger than the right side. And another patient on the, um, the video is not running, 
can I go back? Yeah. So um, the uh, the patient on the right side that have a SVC syndrome and it was running in the in the room, but I don't know why. Uh, you can s you he has a, a SVC thrombosis, and I have to extract the ICD in that case, and then to implant again a SICD. And this that was my last nightmare this n this week actually. On the right side, you can see the uh, echography of the patient with a big, massive uh, endocarditis on a, a ICD lead actually that was more than three centimeters. Um, and I removed that with the uh, Angiovac system, and after that, I remove all the uh, the ICDs with the, uh, the with the laser. On the left panel, you can see what I get with the what I've got with the uh, Angiovac. So that was uh, huge. So because of that, I have to extract a lot of my patients uh, with transvenous ICD. And the extraction is not without risk. In the last report that we have from the US, you can see that the complication at 2.3% uh, of major complication. Within, we, we can see that there is cardiac arrest, death, uh, perforation, uh, and uh, all other uh, hemothorax and pneumothorax. Um, if you compare with the literature between the SICD and the transvenous ICD, the only data that we have are the uh, match score uh, data. We don't have so far the randomized study. And you can see that in terms of lead complication, there is less complication with the SICD. Then in terms of infection, it's almost the same. But in the SICD, you have only 2.4% of the patient who get a, a, an extraction, a removal of the system. And there is no endocarditis described so far. In terms of uh, system failure, it's uh, it's a, about the same, uh, the same rate. Um, in terms of uh, complication, uh, there is the same uh, risk of complication between the transvenous ICD and the SICD when we look at the simple data and the effortless data. And again, for the, uh, for the shock, there is a little less shock with the SICD due to the higher uh, rate zone that we have uh, in put in the uh, SICD patient uh, compared to the uh, transvenous ICD. Uh, in terms of inappropriate shock, uh, at, the at the end, it's almost the same rate. More SVT shocks for, for the um, SVT uh, inappropriate shocks for the transvenous ICD, and more T wave of a sun seizing uh, shocks for the SICD. Um, so, uh, thanks to the guidelines, we know that we can put some SICD in, in certain patients. But should we implant all the everyone with the SICD? We are waiting for the two randomized trial, Praetorian and Atlas, who are coming up uh, in 2020 and 2021, hopefully. And uh, I hope that in after 2020 or 2021, I can say that yes, everyone should have a SICD or at least young patient and patient with prior infection. Blondine, and we'll have Dr. Neri come up and present his thoughts. Screen. Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pablo Neri from the Heart Institute, Ottawa Heart Institute. Uh, and I'd like to thank Matt for organizing this great debate. I'm delighted to be here to um, uh, tell you why ICD, uh, subcutaneous ICD is not yet ready for prime time and it should not be the first line uh, device uh, at this time in 2019 uh, for patients, uh, for young patients or with prior infection who need an ICD. Uh, so. With no further delay, you've seen this slide just a few minutes ago. So as part of the 2016 guidelines, we recommended that uh, SICD should be uh, uh, implanted in patients after a very careful individualized decision making, so in patients with limited vascular access or pocket sites. Uh, and so those decisions are easy, you know, in some patients with congenital heart disease or no access, uh, and, uh, and perhaps with uh, young patients with inherited arrhythmia syndromes uh, uh, in whom uh, they're uh, the main arrhythmia that we're trying to, um, uh, to treat would be VF, uh, then uh, that, uh, that makes it easier to make the case. However, not all young patients. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, there are advantages and disadvantages of its, each system uh, that uh, uh, we must acknowledge. So uh, transvenous ICD uh, enables uh, anti-tachycardia pacing, uh, anti-bradi pacing, and there is no need for ICD uh, uh, D for DFT at the time of implant. Uh, the subcutaneous ICD, as uh, 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 my esteemed colleague outlined, uh, uh, avoids the need for um, uh, transvascular uh, leads. The main disadvantages, of course, venous thrombosis. You've seen a, a case of a very, a very rare case of uh, SVC uh, occlusion. Uh, it will take a few years for us to see another one, uh, but uh, the, uh, there are lead-related complications, and we do acknowledge that risk of complication. The risk of infection, though, if we critically look at the data, uh, it's not higher with transvenous ICDs. With subcutaneous ICD, though, um, uh, there is no uh, ability to deliver ATP, no bradycardia support. You're going to be delivering uh, 65 to 80 joule shocks to uh, our young patients. And there is still, you know, despite uh, uh, the data that you've just seen, there's still a higher risk of inappropriate shocks, and I'll show you why. The, um, uh, the, there's always a need for DFT when in, we're implanting those devices, especially uh, in, uh, in um, uh, patients with higher BMI, mainly because we never know if the shock's going to work, so we have to test it, increasing the procedural morbidity. We all know that shocks are bad. We strive to avoid ICD shocks because uh, just having ICD shocks uh, in ICD patients uh, will increase the risk of death. So um, in subcutaneous ICD, uh, uh, you know, your risk of inappropriate shocks is higher uh, and up to 10%. And as you can see here, uh, the, um, uh, the SICD uh, annual risk of shock is 8% compared, so fourfold higher than the 2% annual risk of inappropriate shock that can be met with modern programming as per the MADIT RIT, so what we currently use for transvenous ICDs. Uh, I know that you've seen data comparing to SIMPLE, but SIMPLE was a trial that was done pre-matted RIT, and those shock rates are comparable to non-matted RIT programming, so they're not applicable to modern programming. So that's why it's the same, because it's higher in SIMPLE. So ATP cannot be delivered uh, but it, with a subcutaneous, but it can be delivered with an, um, um, a transvenous ICD, and will reduce the likelihood of a, a shock in, a, in case of a, a VT event by 75 to 94% with up to three trains. That's very compelling. So I would like just a show of hands. If you need an ICD, and you, we are, you know, most of us here are young or would consider ourselves young, what would you like? You would like an ICD that at your first VT, monomorphic VT episode, if you have one, it would deliver you a shock the first and every single time after. So a painful, distressful shock. Or you can also choose, perhaps, along with the CCS guidelines from 2016, to uh, have a transvenous ICD, which will give you ATP, which you know, it will terminate that uh, ventricular tachycardia uh, in 70% uh, of the time. So there are certainly some populations of young patients who are not uh, well served by an SICD and do deserve a transvenous device. If you have, a pre you know, for secondary prevention, known sustained uh, monomorphic VT, if, even if you have had frequent um, runs of uh, monomorphic, prolonged runs of uh, monomorphic VT, ARVC and sarcoidosis given the high burden um, uh, of uh, ventricular arrhythmias and risk of AV block. The data on uh, SICD is not yet ready for prime time. There is lack of uh, 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 randomized trial data, as we know, and not a lot of long-term data, you know, not a huge number of studies, pr prospective long-term studies have been uh, completed, and the risk of inappropriate shocks and uh, infection, even lead reposition remains, and Dr. Mondesair agrees with me because they don't know, that's why they're running the trial. So. We should individualize always. Thank you. Okay, so do we have any questions for our two presenters? How many people are uh, implanting SICDs in uh, young, the young patients routinely? We have quite a Part few. Of the randomized Trial. Yeah. A part of the randomized trial. Oh, I see. Okay. So outside of the randomized trial, we have a couple. So, uh, you know, the, the concern that I have is we, we saw a lot of data there about appropriate, inappropriate shock rates, but there's no other way for an SICD to terminate ventricular arrhythmia other than to shock them. So do we know anything about appropriate shock rates in patients uh, compared to a transvenous ICD where you have ATP available? <laughs> 
actually, that was fast, but I show you the, the, the slide where there is a little less uh, shocks in uh, SICD uh, when you're comparing the effortless um, population with the simple population. But as uh, Pablo has said, the simple population was before the Madrid treat uh, uh, area. So the, uh, the, the rate of the, t of the VT zone in the simple uh, population was very low, actually lower than in MADIT rate. So I think that can explain the difference between the SICD and the transvenous um, for the, in terms of shocks, of appropriate shock and effective shocks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. Uh, I, 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 I think that's a very important point. And, uh, you know, uh, if we, I, I think that's why for us to, uh, uh, to um, uh, recommend it uh, for all young patients, we would need data, uh, prospective data from uh, the two RCTs that are ongoing to really compare with modern programming, the late detection high rate as we currently use for transvenous ICDs, because we do know that the risk of inappropriate shocks is, is quite low with those devices. So. Uh, I, I think we should try to avoid uh, inappropriate shocks um, uh, in, in, in the young patients. They are, they're very traumatic events. And, and again, with the ability of ATP, you, you also provide the, the, the option of uh, terminating uh, appropriate, you know, uh, uh, appropriate uh, events. So, so there is a, there's definitely a, a potential advantage there. And we would need, I would like to see the randomized trial data before um, um, uh, making a widespread recommendation. One of the concerns I have, as I'm sure others do, is that we're not going to see the lead fracture rates because the time of follow-up in the randomized trials will be short. So, you know, young people where, you know, ideally their leads would last 10 years, you know, we really need that long-term follow-up data to see those curves, di curves diverge. Um, so, you know, I know there's some... Uh, Boston scientific people in the room, maybe they consider funding <laughs> for longer, Extension. you know, um, and, and maybe they, we could see that, that difference. It would, yeah. um, actually, in Atlas, we have uh, two different primary endpoints. The first one is the lead dysfunction complication at six months. So all the complication related to the lead implantation uh, between the transvenous ICD and the uh, SICD. Um, if you look at the data that we have on transvenous ICD and complication occurred on the uh, lead uh, in young patients at, one, at uh, eight years, almost 40% 40, 40 of the patients have a complication on the lead. So it's very huge and it's not a very long, uh, long term of, uh, of time to have the complication. But yeah, we are looking for doing a long term ATLAS uh, follow up uh, to try to get that. So Blondine, there may not be everybody, we didn't have a lot of time during the debate to talk about ATLAS. Do you want to tell everyone what the criteria are for So ATLAS is going to compare the SICD and the transvenous ICD in every patient who need a VVI ICD uh, in primary or secondary prevention for all patients under 60 years old or up to 60 years old if there's some risk like uh, valvular cardiomyopathy, like uh, hemodialysis, like previous infection in the, uh, with the transvenous ICD. Um, so we randomize uh, one to one the SICD and the transvenous ICD. We have uh, 14 centers running on uh, so far in Canada. It's a national uh, trial. And we have almost 70% of the patients on the world so far, so we hope that we can hand that before the end of the next year. Excellent, congratulations. I think we have a question. That yeah, Kat so th this is uh, the next question for section three credits. Um, I'm gonna ask the question, and then we'll unlock the question in the Q&A, which will give you what, uh, you know, a discussion around it. It's not actually a multiple choice question or a answer the question, but you'll, you'll see what I mean once we unlock it. Um, so a 25-year-old man presents with resuscitated cardiac arrest, recent upper respiratory tract infection with fever. Um, the workup's negative, so he'd be a, a CASPER-type workup. Um, hopefully everybody's aware of CASPER, where um, idiopathic uh, cardiac arrest are randomized into a registry. Uh, this is Andrew Cron's um, registry. So normal echo, uh, normal CTA, uh, no valvulopathy, normal ejection fraction. It gets an MRI, it's normal. Has a stress test, normal. Um, epi infusion, this is his procainamide infusion, which um, I'll just give you a second to review it, but I think most people can see there's a type one Brugada pattern. 
And so the, the question is, should this man receive an ICD? And if yes, should this man receive a transvenous or a subcutaneous ICD? Um, and then we'll unlock the, the answer that you can read at any time. Um, I didn't want to spend a lot of time going through the answer now because there's a lot of text, uh, as you can see there, which you can't read. Okay. Good. Any other um, questions, comments about subcutaneous ICD before we move to the next topic? Okay, good. Oh, good. okay great. Thank you. Uh, so with the next uh, two speakers, why don't we have them come up here to uh, the stage. Uh, the debate is a leadless pacemaker should, should or should not be implanted in patients expecting to receive a single chamber pacemaker. And Dr. Ha is going to do the should, and Dr. Callum Redpath is going to do the should not. So come on up here, Andrew. You can introduce yourself for your Thanks. Hi, uh, my, name is my name is Andrew Ha. I'm an EP uh, person working at Toronto General Hospital. Uh, I have no disclosure pertaining to this uh, technology. I don't put in leadless, so um, I was asked to give uh, uh, some statements recommending why it should be considered uh, in patients who need a single chamber pacemaking device. So I think, you know, the, just, just a little bit of background. So currently there are two uh, types of leadless pacemakers available. One is a nano stem by Abbott St. Jude Medical. The other is uh, Micra by Medtronic. I think the, the, the biggest, like as you can tell from the chest x-ray, the biggest fundamental difference between the transvenous uh, pacemaker and a leadless device is that you don't have the, you don't have a pocket and you don't have a lead. And I think that's kind of the foundational difference which drives, you know, uh, eventually the, the decision to implant one, ver one device versus the other. And I think clinically that's important too because I think all of us who take care of patients with devices uh, have a lot of nightmares, perhaps issues, angst, uh, patient coming with pocket-related complications, infection, hematoma, uh, erosion, and also lead-related uh, issues, uh, namely, you know, lead dislodgements and fractures. Uh, and I think, you know, this debate should be framed or should be done with the understanding that there's actually there's no published randomized trial comparing the efficacy and safety of one type of technology over the other. So all of the uh, information that we present to you is based on observational data, expert opinion, and personal opinion as well. So be, in, in light of that, I'm going to present a couple of uh, uh, studies which try to compare the safety and efficacy of leadless pacemakers versus transvenous systems. So this is uh, one of the real-world uh, micro post-approval registry, about 1,800 patients. Uh, what they did was that they compared uh, this cohort of 1,800 patients to about uh, 2,000 patients from traditional uh, transvenous pacemakers in Medtronic trials. And these are the, the in, uh, information derived. So I think the, the most striking difference between these two uh, types of technology is that uh, transvenous pacemakers were associated with much higher rates of total complications, which are defined as system or procedure-related events resulting in death, permanent loss of device function, hospitalization, prolonged hospitalization, or even system revision, almost a three-fold difference. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, you're looking at three-fold increase in the t complications, hospitalization, and system revision. There is a slight signal uh, in terms of death and loss of device function, not in favor of the leadless uh, system. This is another uh, study published recently comparing, once again, the same aspect. So this is uh, from three centers which implanted uh, devices in the context of trials, so a combination of the micro device and also the nano stem. And they used propensity matching to compare to another 220 patients who received transvenous pacemakers. I think, once again, I want to highlight some of the differences in terms of the outcomes between these two technologies. Specific specifically, um, transvenous patients uh, have no surprise, a, a non-trivial proportion of lead issues, dis dislocations, access-related issues, pneumothorax, hemothorax, pacing threshold issues, and also pocket-related complications. On the other hand, I think I want to highlight that in leadless pacemaker, the main complication relates to vascular, uh, namely, you know, because of the larger sheath being used in a groin. Uh, but not, uh, obviating lead-related issues and pocket-related issues, I think, are important considerations. I just want to also highlight that NanoStem has an advisory, a battery advisory, in which there's premature battery um, depletion, which led to a higher uh, total number of complications in this study because there's a higher need for revisions. Um, but we haven't seen that in a micro device thus far. <laughs> 
this is my final slide. I think I, I just want to put a, a table comparing, like, if I'm a, a patient or a physician recommending this treatment, what are some of the aspects I wanted to consider? First of all, lead and pocket related complications, virtually none uh, in leadless, and you have lots of it in uh, transvenous systems. In terms of perforation pericardial issues, there were a slight high, slightly high signals at the uh, early days of the implants with the devices, but with recent data based on a uh, micro PAR post approval uh, registry, less than 1%. Uh, if you want to remove the device, there is data saying that you can achieve up to a 90% success rate move, removing the leadless for devices older uh, by more than a year, whereas if a chronic device, you need to do a total system laser lead extraction with risks. Uh, we do have less uh, longer-term follow-up with leadless devices, but that will come over time. And finally, cost. Currently, probably about 10 times more than the transvenous, but uh, once again, over time, like many te technologies, that should uh, come down over time. Thanks. Hello, how do you do? Um, my name's Callum Redpath. I'm one of the EPs in, in Ottawa. Um, <clears throat> since leadless technology is disruptive, I'm going to be a little bit disruptive, but it's all been very uh, friendly and data-driven. And the point I want to make is exactly, you'll see no data up there because there have been no randomized controlled trials in le of leadless technology against transvenous technology in, uh, in braddock therapy. So <clears throat> I think it's important to remember that. And also remember when it comes to debates, although uh, Andrew is one of the most considerate and conscientious physicians you'll find, I'll blame his teachers. Um, <clears throat> you know, we have to be aware that opinions are like bottoms. We all have one, but some are more useful than others. So, simply put, leadless pacemakers should not be, Im well, ooh. So the, so the title we were given was a patient should should expect to receive a, pa a leadless uh, pacemaker. And so I don't think patients should expect to receive a leadless pacemaker because, first of all, there is no RCT data demonstrating superiority of one technology over others. And so the main thing is you look at complications. And I think in a Canadian audience, it's really important to remember that our Canadian complication rate is nothing like that you will see in the propensity match registry data. And so I'll use uh, PADIT as, as an example of that. You know, more than 19,000 uh, 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 device implants with a complication rate as far as infection of about uh, 0.6 for VVI pacemakers and uh, uh, essentially about 0.8 overall. And yet in, this, in the stated propensity match uh, registries that you'll see comparing leadless to transvenous technology, the, comp the, the, pay the infection rate is 2 to 3 to 4 percent. And uh, it's simply, you know, you're not comparing like with like. So simply put, the complication rate for um, transvenous pacemakers, we know there have been more than 50 million devices, we think, implanted, um, and currently 1 million transvenous devices a year in 2019, we think, are going in. So we have an extremely good idea of what the complication rates for transvenous technology are. It's clear what we can, that we, when we discuss these with our patients, we have very good confidence in what we know we're dealing with. And so the complications of leadless technology for if, at, uh, at five years are unknown because there's not been five years of follow-up. And so, you know, I don't want to be like Statler and Waldorf and the Muppets, but if you don't know what you don't know, then we have to say, we don't know. And so I would not believe, do, I do not believe that we should be implanting devices with 10, 11, or 13 years of battery life with currently three to four years of, of, uh, of follow-up. And if you look <clears throat> at the transvenous technology uh, complications, um, you know, we think that at five years, according to the largest uh, 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 data set from the US, that it's 15%. Now, if you look at three-year data in, from the nanostim, uh, that's 10%. So it's not a striking um, improvement. Yes, it's appealing technology, eliminates the problems with the pocket, it eliminates the, pocket, the problems with the lead. But remember, there are always unknown unknowns. And of course, when, you, when we talk about the leadless technology at the moment, really in Canada, we're talking exclusively about Micra. 
look what happened to the nanostim. So <clears throat> you know, we talk about extraction rates, but we, we, you know, it's 90%. So one in 10 of when you have, to, you have to do an extraction, you fail. You can't even extract it. Now, I implant leadless technology but uh, in, in our institution, but I've still done three times as many in pigs than I've done in humans. And we've had that technology for two years because we use it only when we have to, when patients have problems with vascular access, um, with infection, or some other issue that we think that that's uh, you know, useful with other conduits for renal dialysis and so on. So I think that complications and reliability are not necessarily in favor of leadless technology and the big question mark is we don't know what we don't know. And then <clears throat> finally, the cost. And it's a tenfold difference. Yes, it's attractive technology, but would you really spend 10 times what you want for, you know, for something that you don't know how long it's gonna last, whether it's gonna do well for the patient or not, or would you rather you know, <clears throat> bet on known technology? And then the logistics are, it's a damn sight more awkward to, to do than temporary pacing. And so I would say transvenous technology is here to stay. Leadless is the future, perhaps. So um, please come up and ask questions. No one's asked a question yet. Um, and also, I want some of the uh, experts in the field to contribute, please. Um, so wh what do you guys really think? <laughs> I think our approach is very similar to Callum's. You know, we only would, uh, in 2019, we would you know, only implant these devices in very select cases where, you know, it's really not a good option with a transvenous system, for example, access or, you know, pocket issues. Um, I think that's driven, like the Callum said, you know, the, the absence of long-term data and also, uh, you know, the cost. Yeah. But, but yeah. I think that will be overcome in the future. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I, I implanted some of the um, nanostim devices yeah. And there were about, I think, 22 patients implanted in Vancouver. And we were all devastated when there was the battery uh, advisory. And it's amazing, the psychology. Of course, all these patients were early adopters, so they were sort of in for a penny, in for a pound. But they all asked if they could have another one. You know, there was no, they were really disappointed to have to go back to a transvenous. You know, they've been telling their friends that they had this new pacemaker. And so they were totally biased, of course. But it was interesting how, how much they enjoyed it or were satisfied with it. And maybe they would have been satisfied with a uh, transvenous as well. And it's not a randomized trial, but there, there was a lot of that patient satisfaction. Hey, Larry. Yeah, I, uh, I sort of echo Callum's unknown unknowns in this one is, is I always question you're putting something with mass inside the heart, which is beating 100,000 times a day. And that thing is swinging back and forth. And I, I worry about, you know, are we going to see erosions at five years, 10 years down the road? What, are they going to end up in the pericardial space, whatever? Uh, so I, the unknown unknowns to me are always a bit of a concern. Is there any data, I mean, for, you were involved in the NanoSim study early. Is there any data from, let's say, cardiac surgery from the US where a lot of people have bullets in their hearts? Uh, what happens to them over years? Usually they try and take them out, but is there any data about erosions, anything like that? I haven't seen any. Derek, do you, uh, Bernard, Francois, Derek, David? Yeah, so we've got a reasonable experience with um, both. Uh, we're still doing a fair number, probably a couple a month. Of the, uh, of the current leadless device because there's only one available. I'm way more optimistic than some of the concerns that Callum's raised. So as you said, the patients love them. It's not that they think they're okay, they love them and they're really, really unhappy if they have to go to a transvenous system. So we use them in patients with high risk of infections. Um, fair enough that in PADIT the overall infection rate was low but certainly not in certain subgroups of patients. So chronic hemodialysis with indwelling catheters we would almost routinely put in a, a, a um, leadless pacemaker. Patients with vascular access issues, I spend a good chunk of my time doing complex extraction, and I can tell you removing one of these is a heck of a lot easier than a transvenous lead. 
Um, I, I think given their size and where they're located, erosion would be very unlikely. Remember, they're not a lot bigger than an ICD lead in terms of diameter. So they're certainly a little stiffer than an ICD lead, but you don't have the rest of that lead. And the rest of that lead is what gets you into trouble with, with removal. It's all the basket or access issues. So if they were the same price or similarly priced to Transvena systems, I would routinely use them for everyone, um, but they're not. And so the issue is more how do we, how do we deal with the cost? Because the cost is roughly 10 plus times the cost. The other big thing is that they're not perfect for everyone, right? So if you need a dual chamber device or even a VDD, presently you don't have that option. You will have that option soon with a VDD-based um, leadless pacemaker, and then dual chamber leadless pacing is not far off. So I, I think those things will be available, but they're, they're actually relatively straightforward to put in. It, like everything, sometimes they're more complicated, but they the patients absolutely love them, and the long-term results have been really, really good with them. The battery advisory happens. It's new technology. Um, yeah. You know, there's, we've had that issue with leads over and over again, so I don't think we should, you know, get rid of it just because of a single issue. Yeah. There. Just, so a question that I would have then for Derek, who's done a lot, and, and Andrew and whoever else. Would you put one of these in a 25-year-old who's going to potentially live for another 60 years, where you may have to put in six of them? Yes. I wouldn't hesitate. So I wouldn't put in six. I would remove them as I went along. Um, well, the longest I've done is six years. Um, it's, it's straightforward to get a six-year-old um, nano stem out as it is to get a six-year-old ICD lead. Um, I don't know. Micra, Micra is a, a smaller device. It's short, and there's some data on encapsulation. So less well known in terms of whether you can do that. So the problem is not that they um, have fibrosis, everything's going to have fibrosis, but it's that the fibro fibrotic capsule actually covers the entire device if you stick it deep within the trabeculae. And the, the data is that typically after a year or so, a lot of those devices are not retrievable. Having said that, people have new approaches to it, and um, I think they likely will be removable sometime in the future. But that, think, that's a big issue. I think that's a huge issue, actually. I think we need to be very cognizant of that in the type of patient that Larry brought up. Now, the only other case where I think uh, a micra, or which is the only one we have on the market at the moment, um, is in patient with prior infection. I think it's a patient who tolerates single chamber pacing and has had an infection should not get a transvenous lead back. If it's at all avoidable. I think the micra uh, lead infections, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, if, Infections rates are so low with the um, the leadless pacemakers that I really think they should be considered in those patients. So I think we need to move on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have uh, Dr. Thibault come up. Um, so Bernard Thibault is uh, from a home homegrown. Uh, he's from Montreal, and uh, he'll be speaking about his bundle pacing. Thank you. Five minutes, so I've got to race you. No time for nice teas, nothing. <laughs> Recommendation 58. We recommend CRT in all patients with QRS duration with left bundle branch block and a QRS that's above 130 milliseconds. It is a strong recommendation with a high quality evidence. End of debate. Disclosures, I'm gonna be talking about something that there's no devices no lead approved for his bundle pacing. I concede victory. There are hundreds of trials, randomized control trials, thousands of patients, decades of follow-up. Well, on my side, I only have one trial, 41 patients with six months follow-up. CRT saves lives, improves well-being, decreases hospitalizations, and improves LV function. So my point is, left bundle branch block is an electrical disease, especially if it's wide QRS. This is one of my last CRT case. Patients referred to me, according to guidelines, left bundle branch block, a QRS duration 134 milliseconds. The pace QRS with BIV was 152 milliseconds. Have I helped him? You know. It's in a research protocol. <laughs> so if you look at the data, 
that's meta-analysis published in August this year, looking at all the trials that use by the pacing, and the average QRS duration that you can get is 146 milliseconds. This is what happens when you take a patient with a narrow QRS and you implant a by V defibrillator. This is what we used to do in the lesser heart study. QRS went from 100 to 140 milliseconds, ejection fraction dropped from 33 to 22 percent. The hope is the reverse that we can take a patient at 140 milliseconds, give him a cure duration of 100 milliseconds, and improve his ejection fraction. There is nothing quicker than his percage system to conduct electricity, 10,000 kilometers per hour, less than one-tenth of a second to get the whole heart activated. So that's what you get if you screw a lead at the level of his bundle. You have his, and then you've captured the conduction system. It gives you an identical narrow QRS. And this is what you get with his bundle pacing as QRS duration. But most of the time, this is QRS as measured by the ECG machine from the spike to the end of QRS. The actual QRS is sometimes 40 milliseconds shorter than this. It's just like the delta wave. And that's the position of an his bundle lead in a patient who had the TAVI, left bundle branch block, and we could screw the lead distal to the block. So that's his QRS before with the left bundle branch block, first degree V block, and he was back to a QRS of 130 milliseconds, which is an IVCD and the QRS that he had before his TAVI. So the only study that's been presented at the HRS included 41 patients, about 50% crossover in one group, 25% in the other group. If you look at the per protocol analysis, they could achieve a cure duration of 124 milliseconds in patients who had huge QRS to start with, above 160 and left bundle branch block. So it's impossible to correct left bundle branch block by his bundle pacing. That's one example. 195 milliseconds, typical left bundle branch block, narrower QRS, 125. This is much better than we can achieve what we achieve usually. Why is that so? That's an article that you have. Two thirds of the left bundle branch block are proximal in heart failure patients, either at the level of the HIS or the very proximal left bundle branch. So it should be possible to correct this left bundle branch block in a significant proportion of patients. So in up to 50% of the patients, you can. Left bundle branch pacing is the future. If you can go across the septum with the same lead, capture the left bundle branch, you will achieve 90% correction of the left bundle branch block with an arrow QRS. So this is how they do it. You've got the his bundle lead, and then you go distally about one or two centimeters distally towards the apex. You screw the lead across the septum, and you get to the left bundle. And the left bundle is something that you can easily capture, and you get narrow QRS. So that's the conclusion. <laughs> Thanks, Bernard. And we'll have Dr. Stearns uh, come up uh, to talk about why he thinks Bernard is wrong. Thank you very much. I agree with everything that Bernard said. So thank you for doing my argument. <laughs> so um, let's see. Oh, I was going to say I'm not on my slides yet. How come I'm already counting down? Yeah. Okay. So this bundle pacing should not be used in all of your patients uh, that have a CRT indication. And I have to admit, I didn't know Bernard would be up here. So I actually brought along a virtual Bernard that would be up in the corner who could, you know, so you can see what he's thinking about as, as we go through. Uh, I'm surprised we haven't seen this curve yet today because we're talking about a lot of new tech. But basically, with technology, there's that peak of inflated expectations early as everybody thinks this is, is great. And then there's the trough of disillusionment that follows before you get to the balance. And that really sort of fits for everything that we've seen today. With his bundle pacing, I think we're riding up that curve. If you follow Twitter, we're at the very peak of that peak. Uh, and really, it now has to find its place. Basically, there's two indications for CRT. The block HF indication, and those are patients who are going to require pacing at a high burden, and pacing could make them worse. Uh, 
uh, in that case, you're trying to prevent the widening with RV apical pacing. The other one is if you have disynergy from a left bundle branch block or a wide uh, conduction delay, and you're trying to restore synergy. And those are sort of the two indications, and I broke those up a bit. I completely agree with Bernard. There is nothing better than the Hisper-Kinji system. So if that thing is working, and you can activate the heart through the Hisper-Kinji system, that's the best way to activate the heart. So with a narrow QRS, if you're going to do an AV node ablation or you have to pace, I think that is the way to go. And there is some data, observational studies, showing that you uh, don't have a difference in mortality, but if you look at heart failure hospitalization, his bundle pacing has fewer heart failure hospitalizations at the cost of a somewhat more complex procedure, longer fluoro times, higher thresholds in the long run, which could burn out batteries. So basically, Bernard's pretty happy because I'm <laughs> fighting for his side. Uh, there is, of course, really good data on that with CRT. The Block HF trial was the one that showed that uh, CRT pacing was better than um, RV apical. Um, and there's other ones that have been mentioned already earlier today. Uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> fine. We're going on to the next one. But how about resynchronization pacing? Instead of an LV lead, should we be using a His bundle lead to try and recruit? Or in addition to an LV lead, for instance, fuse the LV lead with a His. There might be a future for that. Not a lot of data on it. So I'll just talk about instead of. Um, again, I'm going to go to this one. Same slide Bernard showed. Bottom line is, yes, two-thirds of the time the block is up high, but depends on where that block is as to whether you can correct that left bundle. If it's very high, the correction rates could be as high as 90%. As soon as you move down, though, the correction rate drops to about 65% if it's a left bundle to 0% if the Hisper-Kinji system's working and the delay is actually distally because you've got a big dilated ventricle. You can pace as high output as you want. You're not going to capture anything more distally if the system works to get it out there. It just takes a long time. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> evidence of CRT, again, randomized trials, 5,000 people. That is twice as many people who are at the CCC this year. For his bundle pacing that, oh, sorry, yeah, it, as Bernard said, 40 people, which represents about those four tables. So we do have some more data that we need. The his sync trial, Bernard's already gone over it, but the bottom line there is, 48% crossover. In other words, almost half of the time they tried to get a hiss, they couldn't get resynchronization with it and had to go over to CRT. Yes, you got narrow QRSs, but when it came down to ejection fraction responses, the small numbers really didn't give us that data. Okay, so yeah, you presented <laughs> that already. What are the issues with hiss bundles, though? These are the unknown unknowns. Late threshold rise, loss of capture, progressive subhissian disease that could lead to loss of capture down the road potential for VSD, tough late lead extractions, and we don't have long-term data. If we looked at uh, Jack, uh, an experience center here, 75% acute implant uh, success, so not 100%, but a threshold rise in 30%. And if you look on the far right there, is actually the way these were programmed at one year was at five volt output in one millisecond. So very high outputs, it'll burn through batteries quickly. So then if we look at this, his bundle complications, 1,375 articles. His bundle complications, Google, 300,000. His bundle pacing VSD, 400,000. Okay, yes, I'm lying. None of them actually have been described. So bottom line, extraction. If you want to know what a his bundle looks like, there it is on the end of the lead. <laughs> okay. So in conclusion, CRT works. His bundle might. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Great. Thanks, guys. So uh, please come up and ask some questions. Uh, or uh, I, there may be some questions that have come through the question and answer on the, mo on the uh, session. Um, Bernard, what's your take, really? It's your, well, uh, I was defending yeah, the I know, position I know, exactly, against exactly. my exactly. career. <laughs> so yeah. just be clear, if it's a, there's a clear indication for CRT, the patients get a BIV device as first intent. If you fail, if you don't, if the patient has no branches, I think that that's definitely an option that you can consider, but there are only unknowns. We do not know the long term of these patients. It's different for the block HF patients. If you've got a patient, for instance, with slow AF, ejection fraction of 40% and narrow QRS, then his model does a great job. 
it allows you it, it I think it's better to go over to conduction system that's working fine than to creating by v pacing or RV pacing would be which would be our so basically I think that we agree that it's mostly block HF indications that we're using it now we're using is mono pacing for the CRT where I'm still a strong proponent of what's known and we have thousands of patients and there may be more than just cure restoration benef benefits from CRT do you think we'll get to a point where if a dual chamber pacing patient, you try the HIS first, and then if you can get a narrow QS, you leave it there? Or how, how do you think that'll transpire? Uh, I can tell you about one of my patients, a 28 year old patient. I thought it was a perfect patient for his model pacing and not having a, a backup lead in the right ventricle. He was in congenital heart block, but two to one. He's got a very good rhythm at 48. Sinus rhythm at 80 beats per minute, so that gives him 40 beats. And he's a farmer, so he's totally asymptomatic. So I didn't put a lead or RV lead in place. His threshold was very nice at the time of implant, below one volt. At follow ups, the thresholds increased up to three, four volts now. So I don't want him to have a device that's going to last three years. Let's see what's happening. So we've got to be very, very prudent. And I totally agree with Larry. There is this curve now, we are at the peak of over enthusiasm. Yeah. The technology and this will find its own place. Things will settle down after a while and kind of find its own place. So we have a question from the audience. Uh, given that we have been hearing about his bundle pacing for more than 10 years, why are there so few studies examining this? <laughs> Actually, it was first described back in the 70s, so uh, it's been around for a long time. Uh, I think, I think uh, what's happened basically, I think the block HF and the CRT data basically had people looking at it again saying, okay, what else can we do? And, and there are centers that have jumped into it uh, in a big way within the last five or ten years. It took some technology to be able to do it routinely. And again, the, the tools are not bad for it now, but there's much better tech coming uh, where we'll be able to map. Uh, they hiss very well and be much more accurate about placing the, the leads and there may be then more reliable data on longe longevity of the leads and things like that. So I think what happened is, is it just took a while for the evidence to show that RV apical pacing is bad. Okay, we got a better option. We got CRT. Is there something better that we can do? You know what? This is something that we can try and I think that it's, it's in that early adoption phase. Uh, it is starting to expand like crazy right now, and I, and I totally agree with Bernard. I think the next level is going to be the left bundle pacing. And looking at his bundle versus left bundle pacing, I think, is going to be the next progression. So this is a changing field. That's why electrophysiology is so fun, because if you miss a couple of meetings, you're way behind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any other questions or comments there, from the... There is one other uh, take that you, uh, conclusions that you can draw from the his sync study. If you look at per protocol, the ejection fraction improvement was the same in both. So CRT is still a very good treatment. His model was not superior to CRT. They pr both provided excellent res uh, response in terms of ejection fraction. So it's not yeah. discrediting CRT. So I guess the big message is don't go out and start this right away. Let's wait. Let's figure it out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, take it from there. We Absolutely. were talking about our, our numbers, and Bernard's done more than I have. But the bottom line, everyone we're doing, we're putting into a registry. We're following them. We're checking their ejection fractions. We're checking their thresholds. And I think everybody who does these really needs to follow them closely until we get a Canadian registry or a randomized trial. Yeah. Great. Great. Excellent. Thank you very much. Our final debate, which moves us a little bit away from technology um, to a different question. Uh, it's Dr. Philippot and Dr. Exner. Ejection fraction is or is not the optimal assessment of risk of sudden death in patients being evaluated for an implantable defibrillator. Dr. Philippot, we'll go first. Okay, thank you very much. So we're going to start by looking at the guidelines. What do we know now? And I would remember you that Dr. Exner was on that primary panel where we actually recommend implantation of an ICD if your ejection fraction is below 30%, and it may be indicated if it's between 31 and 35. You need to make sure you have optimal medical treatment for three months, three months after revascularization, or 40 days after MI. And you need to reassess LV ejection fraction after MI. So ejection fraction is still useful. And this was based on all those trials that you know, 
So on top, you have the impact of ICD on sudden cardiac death and on mortality in the bottom. So you see that all are in favor of an ICD in patients with reduced ejection fraction. Well, in the non-ischemic population, if, even if the Danish trial put some questioning about the non-ischemic population, when you look in meta-analysis, still, non-ischemic with low ejection fraction benefit from an ICD, still based on ejection fraction. What about Entresto? It's probably the best drug in heart failure. But if you add an ICD on top of Entresto in low ejection fraction patient, you still have a benefit. Are we good at this in Canada? So this is also another manuscript from Derek. When they look at 1,300 ICD procedure performed in Canada, and the mean ejection fraction was 32%, so quite in the guidelines. Less than 1% were discordant with actual guidelines. If you look at the CRT implants and our Canadian guidelines, 10% were inconsistent, but there's different issues there. But overall, over 90% of all the implanted devices were according to guidelines and appropriate. So we're not doing that bad there. We also know that the change in left ejection fraction after MI is probably very important. So before you think you're gonna discard EF for ICD implantation, we should make sure that we reassess EF, EF and use it correctly. So another manuscript from Dr. Exner, so he really likes ejection fraction assessment. So <laughs> you need to do it after the MI, so probably uh, beyond six weeks. And the, pa the patients who don't have a better ejection fraction on follow-up, they do less well. So of the cohort who had sudden cardiac death on the right, you see that the ejection fraction to begin with is quite around what we use in the guidelines, but they don't improve their EF after six weeks. On the left side, the group with no sudden death, they're outside the guidelines that we use now, and they improve their ejection fraction. So remeasure your EF. So are we good at that? No, we're not. That's where we should work more. Another manuscript from Dr. Exner looking at reassessment of ejection fraction in Canada. And what we know is we think we do a good job, but we don't. Less than 50% of patients have their ejection fraction reassessed after MI. So that's where we should do something because their risk is increased. So is left ejection fraction enough to prevent sudden cardiac death? We used it for a long time. We know that if you have a reduced EF, you have higher mortality. And if you put an ICD in a reduced EF patient, you save lives. All the other tests that Derek will talk about, we're not gonna come up with only one test that's gonna predict more than the ejection fraction for now. And what is the optimal ejection fraction? This is another study after MI where they did EP study in patients. And you see that the lower your ejection fraction is, higher is your positive EP studies. And when you look at the groups on the left side, you see that ejection fraction less than 30% increase a lot their risk of sudden death, 31 to 35 in the middle, and lower risk on the bottom. So quite according to what we do. So in conclusion, I think left ejection fraction is still the corner store of clinical indication. So as a clinician, ejection fraction is still important. All the other tests are interesting we do collaborate and do research, but for me, as a clinician, left ventricular ejection fraction is still good. And at the end of this, no matter what we're gonna do, we're never gonna be able to risk stratify everybody. So please promote AED in your community and everywhere to save the other ones. Thanks. All right, so my job is to defend against a very worthy opponent. And it's hard because when you've got someone like Dr. Philippon, you know, you have to say, who does he remind you of? And, you know, Dr. Philippon is the Yoda of electrophysiology in Canada. He's a very learned individual, and it's going to be hard to argue, but I think you'll be convinced by the end of this. There are two undisputed facts. And that is that ICD therapy does prevent death from sudden cardiac arrest and that pathophysiological markers for sudden cardiac arrest exist today. The question we have is, is EF the right one? So this is a uh, study that summarizes the population at risk of sudden death, their individual risk on the left side and the number of individuals that have that event on the right. 
And you can see if you use Dr. Philippon's approach and you find every individual who's either survived a cardiac arrest or in whom they've got a low ejection fraction implant in ICD, you'll be able to maybe reduce sudden death in Canada by 10 to 15 percent. Is 10 to 15 percent reasonable? That's up to you. My goal is to say, can we actually have a more meaningful impact on the risk of sudden death and can we use other tools that perhaps are better than ejection fraction to achieve that? The other thing that's really important is that as our treatment of patients with heart disease changes, so does the utility of some of our tests. And this shows that in the early uh, 1980s and 1990s, when we really didn't do a lot for patients in terms of revascularization, and, um, we, didn't, we had about a 65, 70% sensitivity of ejection fraction to predict sudden cardiac death. Now it's less than that, closer to about 30 to 40%. So the fact that we're treating patients better has had a result in the utility of ejection fraction dropping over time. The second point that I want to make, and probably the most important thing, is that our state of the art for risk stratification is summarized here. We take people, we measure their ejection fraction, and we say you're at lower, you're at high risk. And then we say, if you're at high risk, we're going to put a defibrillator in. And the good news is that we pick up about a third of the post-MI patients at risk. The bad news is we miss two-thirds. Likewise, if we say, in fact, you're at risk of having a sudden cardiac arrest, we identify a risk of about 20%. So now I'm going to change that and say, I've got a new biomarker for prostate cancer or for breast cancer. And the good news is that I identify a third of you who are at risk. I missed two thirds, so that's okay. And if I say you're at risk, you've got a 20% chance. It's meaning you, don't, you have an 80% chance of not having it. I mean, would any of you adopt that biomarker? You'd say, you're an idiot. What are you talking about? So yet, for some reason, we've said ejection fraction is our appropriate biomarker for predicting who should or who should not receive an ICD. And it's really, it's foolish, um, but we seem to continue to do it. If you look at things such as uh, predicting sudden cardiac arrest in the broader community, this is data from the Oregon Sudden Unex Unexpected Death Study. The area under the receiver operating characteristic curve, the ROC curve, for ejection fraction was 0.57. So we're slightly better than chance if we use ejection fraction to identify who's going to have a cardiac arrest. Now, you may be familiar with this, that 60% of the time EF works all the time. But it's actually even not quite as good as that. So as Dr. Philippon is well aware, it's only about 57% of the time. So half the time, almost half the time, ejection fraction is not useful at identifying who in fact is at risk of sudden death. There are other approaches, more complex approaches. One of those is cardiac MRI. Cardiac MRI has an area under the curve of about <coughs> 0.94. We can use ECG. ECG has an odds ratio of about 26. It's like a genetic marker in terms of determining who's at risk of sudden death. And we've done some other work showing that by combining simple measurements, like is there scar present in a person's heart? Do they have abnormal autonomic tone and abnormal variability in their uh, repolarization, that we can show a nine-fold higher risk of sudden death as compared to those who don't. And these are people who essentially both have ejection fractions in a similar gray zone of about 40, 45%. So the undisputed fact is that ICD therapy does prevent death from sudden, or prevent death from sudden cardiac arrest, but the EF is both insensitive and nonspecific, and that pathophysiological markers do exist, but EF is not one of them. And I'll leave this up for further discussion. Yeah, I think, thank you, Derek, that's awesome. Um, because this is such an important trial, I'll give you the time to discuss it. This is additional time. This is additional time, <laughs> yes, and there's no push-ups here. So, so, but to first of all, to, to address it, so yeah, ejection fraction, despite all the, the fact that we have all these risk markers, ejection fraction is the only one that stood the test of time in terms of saying which patients do or don't benefit from a defibrillator. So our approach, I think just like everyone else in the country, is we still use ejection fraction. But I think we really need to be 
you know, looking into this and saying, you know, does it make sense to use ejection fraction? And although it works, it's, it's not a great marker. And we're missing a lot of people who potentially could benefit from an ICD. And we're putting in a lot of defibrillators that aren't really necessary. So that's sort of my take on it. Francois? No, I think you're right. The, uh, there are very interesting data about SCAR using MRI, using autonomic nervous system uh, uh, index to, to, uh, to define a, a higher risk population. The problem is we don't have randomized trials yet to change the guidelines. So we have a lot of patients in, the, in gray zones, uh, ejection fraction between 35 and 45 percent, that sometimes you need something else. And that sub something else is uh, honestly case-based, actually. And sometimes we'll use imaging because it's easier than the neuroatomic uh, uh, stuff uh, to, you know, to make certain. So sometimes we'll use SCAR on MRI or we'll use uh, other tests. Um, Honestly, ejection fraction is easy to use, but, but we're missing a lot of patients that could uh, benefit from prevention of sudden cardiac death with, with uh, outer screening. But I think, you know, refined ICD is, is a great, uh, great ID. I hope we're going to be able to finish and get some data out so we may be uh, able later to change a little bit our way of looking at uh, stratifying uh, sudden cardiac death risk. So how many people in the room are familiar with the refined ICD study? We have a show of hands. You should. <laughs> and how many people see patients with prior MI and have an EF 36 to 50 percent? Quite a few. So, so those of you who didn't raise your hands twice need to learn about the uh, refined ICD study. And Derek, did you did you already go, go through ahead. this? Nope. Yeah. Yeah. Can you go through? So, that? so yeah. I'll try to go through this very briefly. So. Refined ICD is targeted at that group of patients on that first slide who are red. So that's the group of patients who have had an MI who do not appear to be at risk of sudden death because their ejection fraction is currently higher than that 35 percent. The data we have and many others are that patients who have ejection fractions above 50 percent are extremely low risk. There might be lots of them, but their actual individual risk is very small. So we're setting a window of 36 to 50 percent as a marker of SCAR. So the ejection fraction is measured, but it's not really important. It's just saying, is SCAR present or absent? If the patient has an ejection fraction in that range at least two months post MI and out to five years, they're potentially eligible for the study. The only patients who are excluded from that would be patients who are over 80 because we're not interested in putting primary prevention ICDs in people in their 80s and 90s and people who are in permanent atrial fibrillation or on chronic amiodarone therapy. So those are our patients who would be excluded because of the, how the tests work. But basically, once the patient's identified, they undergo a Holter. This is a standard conventional clinical Holter. We then analyze that centrally in a core lab, so you don't have to do any analysis, just have to put the Holter on. If that Holter is abnormal, that individual, even though they might look exactly the same as the individual whose Holter is negative, that individual has a nine-fold higher risk of dying as compared to the individual whose Holter is normal. And the two measurements we make, one is a measurement of repolarization, the other is autonomics. But basically, through that simple test that we use all the time, by measuring specific parameters, we're able to dichotomize the population as very high risk versus very low risk. If the patient is in that very high risk group, they then are eligible to be randomized to either continued usual care, and continued usual care means statins and antiplatelets and ACE inhibitors if appropriate, beta blockers and so forth, or that usual care plus an implantable defibrillator. So we've been at this for a number of years now. We have about half of the population enrolled. We need to enroll the next half of the population this is a CIHR funded trial, also funded by the Canadian Arrhythmia Network, or CANNET. So this isn't an industry study. This is a study that the investigators uh, initiated on our own. And we're hoping to identify a lot more patients who potentially could benefit. And what is your estimate, uh, Derek, of, the, of all the 36 to 50 percent? How many of, of the patients will actually be randomized to usual or ICD just to get the yeah, that's a, great, so that's a great question. So, so I think a couple things are important in terms of the risk stratification. So 
after an MI, approximately 90% of patients will have normal ventricular function. So 90% are gone from the start. Of the remaining 10 to 15% of patients, about two-thirds of those patients will favorably remodel. So we're essentially talking about 5 to 6% of the post-MI population that we would do the Holter on. Of that 5 or 6%, about a third, so about 2% of the post-MI population is those at risk. So we're not talking about putting ICDs in a bunch of people. We're talking about using a very, very selective approach of screening out 98% of patients post-MI and the 2% are the remaining high risk. Perfect. I, I just, I, we're going to get to Vikas. I wanted to just put this question up. Um, and you can read it. This is another post-assessment uh, question for the Section 3 credits. And the answer is, is within the Q&A on your app. Vikas. I just wanted to see what you guys thought about, you know, a lot of the primary profession ICDs we put in don't ever get used, but I think now to design a study to convince an ethics board or clinicians to randomize your patient to a non-ICD when the EF is less than 30 is going to be extremely challenging, so we might never get the answer we're looking for. Yeah, to put the genie back in the bottle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a great question. So, so the tools that we're using, there's actually been literature published on the patients with low rejection fraction. Um, my concern with that is a patient with, low, with a low rejection fraction is a less stable patient than with a high rejection fraction. So the question is how often do you need to repeat those tests? Um, a patient who's had a single infarct or a couple of infarcts is less likely to have progressive LV dysfunction than a patient who's had a big infarct or multiple infarcts. So I agree with you. I think it'll be really difficult to do that study. Um, we have sort of thought about it, but I think at this stage we want to show proof of, proof of concept with this study, and if we can show proof of concept, then maybe that will happen down the road. Um, but I think you're right. It would be very difficult to do that. Okay. There's a couple of audi audience response questions here. So uh, which EF do you rely on when echo, MUGA, cath, maybe an MRI are all different? Oh. <laughs> Well, I, I think the important issue is, is when you assess ejection fraction and you're in a gray zone or you're, you're not sure, use another modality. So if, if you have validation, like in our hospital, we have validation of ECHO against MUGA many years ago done to see uh, what were the correlation of that. So I would, I would use ECHO first because it's the easiest thing to do. Uh, I would encourage people to redo e EF measurement after MI, please, to reassess the patient. And if, if I have a doubt or, or the quality is not good, I will use either MRI or MUGA. So if, 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 I, if I have two discordant measures, now we, often I will go back to the echo lab and, and have a second opinion on the echo. Yeah, obviously it depends on your local expertise. Yeah. And then, you know, going and asking, hey, did you see the endocardial wall really well? And, the, the MRI was different by X of percent, what do you think, and talking to the MRI guys. Um, but I guess the question is, is when they both look accurate, uh, which one, or precise, which one's the more accurate? Um, and I mean, compared to gold standard, it's MRI. Yeah, but sure. the question with MRI is, is it available, and can we afford to do an MRI on everyone? Yeah. Um, and the answers to those are probably not. Um, we, we tend to do an MRI and use that, but the MRI typically gives a lower number than the echo. Um, and if you look at the, the trials where they've done this very carefully in core labs, it's on average about 4 or 5% lower with cardiac MRI. But all of the data we've got in terms of long-term prognosis was all nuclear-based. There's very little data on echo. Okay. Perfect. Great. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the uh, the MRI is probably the. I think There's we, one we, last question. Okay, you want me go to do it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It was. Yes. Uh, is there data on the ST2 biomarker? On the which? ST2. I've not heard of it to be honest, um, unless it didn't translate correctly on the question. This might um, be a quick question because yeah. ST2 <laughs> yeah. biomarker. Yeah. Um, there's a, a variety of biomarkers under study. None of them have been shown useful to date, um, but a lot of them have potential value. The, the goal of what we were trying to do is just come up with a really simple, clinically applicable screening test that could be done in your office, in the hospital, in a family physician's office, could be done anywhere. So we're, we're, we're sort of trying to keep it really simple and hopefully we'll be able to get an answer with that. 
Excellent. Good. Great. Thanks. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Prakash, my co-chair, the planning committee, all the speakers for engaging um, presentations as well as a great discussion. Um, I'm going to volunteer them to be available if you have any questions you want to ask them uh, now. And uh, thank you for your attention. If, if the panelists could come up to the podium here, that would be great.